ahead and get started now. I'm now going to turn it over to David Rice to make introductions. Hello, welcome again to our 56th meeting, roundtable workshop, and well past 60 in all the meetings that we've given. And, and so with that, let me turn things over to our sponsor, John Webb from MMR Resources, and take it away, John. Th thank you, Dave, and uh, good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, good evening, wherever you may be, and uh, welcome to the September 2023 uh, Ivan Workshop. Uh, outstanding uh, presentation today on time domain NMR, uh, being headed up by uh, uh, dear dear friend, uh, dear longtime friend of mine, uh, Mark Taraban, and uh, looking forward to uh, uh, the uh, uh, presentation about to begin. Be before I start, I just wanted to mention, uh, I, I believe everyone's aware that uh, all of the uh, uh, Ivan Workshop videos are uh, uploaded uh, and available on the uh, Ivan website and uh, also on YouTube. Uh, we were a little bit uh, tardy in uh, uploading a very, very good one from uh, uh, this past April ENC, one of the uh, evening sessions uh of that uh, uh week-long meeting uh the uh, uh dear barry uh video uh all about the uh uh well professor barry shapiro uh and his uh, uh nmr newsletter uh, texas a m uh, university nmr newsletter that uh he uh ve very lovingly uh, uh put together and and ran uh, from 1956 to 2001 uh quite a long run and he published uh uh, well over 600 uh, monthly editions of this. Uh, Clemens Anklin of uh, Brooker had, uh, uh, during a COVID period, had uh, uh, assembled a, uh, a digital archive of all of this. And uh, Clemens, uh, uh, in, assisted by uh, Dave Rice, gave a, a very good presentation uh, on the uh, uh, topic. Again, we called it uh, Dear Barry. Anyways, uh, I'll post a link, uh, I'll post a YouTube link uh, in the uh, chat. Uh, once the uh, meeting gets underway, uh, we apologize for uh, being delayed in uploading that, but uh, uh, ha have a look. It's uh, ve very good, uh, very informative material, and uh, uh, certainly historic. Anyways, uh, once again, welcome today. Uh, uh, sponsors, uh, MR Resources and uh, Q1 Instruments, very, very happy to uh, bring these meetings to you, uh, as always. Uh, MR Resources, of course, uh, uh, been around for well, going on 40 years at this point and uh, providing uh, reconditioned systems, uh, reconditioned NMR systems, uh, system relocations, quench recovery. And I also want to remind everyone that they have uh, a very, very uh, a good, fully equipped probe repair shop. And uh, they do literally anything and everything in uh, terms of repairs for uh, room temp probes cryo probes, uh, cryo platforms, and uh, uh, definitely check them out for uh, any of these uh, uh, requirements you might have. Uh, Q1 Instruments, uh, a little bit newer to things, uh, been around for about six years at this point, uh, uh, provides a, a very, very solid lineup of uh, complete NMR spectrometers from uh, 400 megahertz to uh, 600 megahertz, including uh, magnets, consoles, probe, uh, probes, sample changers, and uh, uh, the like, and uh, they uh, very much hold their own with uh, uh, all the competitors out there, and uh, certainly at a uh, uh, much more attractive uh, price point. Uh, that being said, I will uh, turn things over to Krish, and uh, Krish, maybe you can give us the uh, rundown on uh, upcoming uh, meetings, if you would, please. Thank you, John. Uh, hello, everyone. I just wanted to announce what is coming down the pike. Uh, next month in October, um, we are going to have a discussion on fragment-based truck discovery using NMR. Um, exact date and time is being worked out. Very shortly, you should receive information. It will be led by uh, Denny Nanguin Kerner at the Loxo Oncology at Lilly. And again, the details of uh, the panel discussion should come in the usual fashion through email, uh, hopefully by next week. Um, with that, I will turn back on back to John um, to continue this. Thanks. Thank, thank you, Krish. And uh, very, very good uh, ongoing lineup of uh, meetings. We'll uh, keep on going with this uh, well, for many years to come, I think, uh, our little experiment that uh, 
started a few years ago with our Ivan group has, uh, well, become very popular, I'll say. That being said, uh, let me turn it over to uh, Dave Rice. And uh, Dave, if you would kick off the September workshop for us, please. Um, okay, let's get going. And uh, with that, I'll, I'll hand things over to our leader, Mark Caravan, who will introduce to speaking today. Greetings to everyone, and uh, I'm extremely grateful to the Ivan community, which uh, selected me as the leader of this uh, panel. And uh, I try to assemble the uh, presentations today that are from very different areas of application of um, different uh, relaxometry approaches from solid state to relaxometry and to bio, uh, technological drugs, liquids, solids. I'm try we try to embrace all areas of application in this particular uh, webinar right now. And um, we will have uh, three uh, presenters today and uh, I will be going uh, over shortly about the presentations of those presenters. And we will start with the presentation uh, by uh, Dr. Leonid Grunin. And um, his presentation will be on the uh, practical applications of time domain NMR uh, of solids and the routine applications of different techniques, which will involve studies on solids, different approaches of the time domain NMR relaxometry, including machine learning approaches uh, that they are trying to develop. Let me give you a very short um, uh, introduction of Dr. Grunin. Uh, I know him for many years already, and he got his PhD in physical chemistry, and his thesis was on the magnetic relaxation of natural polymers. And he is now a uh, research and development and technical directors of the company Resonance System Gesellschaft mit Beschränktur Haftung in Germany, and uh, of which he is a co-founder and owner. And the company is known for its innovative and uh, customized design of the different benchtop NMR instruments for different applications uh, from solid state to pharmaceutical products, and uh, develop a new uh, hardware and new software for this instrumentation. Uh, for different wide variety of process applications. And with that, I will give the podium for Dr. Grunin, uh, who will share his slides and, and start the presenting. Okay, thank you, Mark. So I have about 20 something minutes. That is the fantastic uh, period to present everything. So that's a great honor to participate in in such an event, uh, we understand that coronavirus is still active, and the, we are sitting in different parts of the uh, of the uh, of the globe. Nonetheless, we are sharing with knowledge. And uh, when Mark uh, asked me to start thinking about what we can present, I would focus on uh, something that is very very typical for uh, our scientific in interest as a company. Uh, so we produce many types of different NMRs, but our private scientific interest is the solid and rigid uh, samples. And uh, uh, so we really like uh, going in deep in these directions. So uh, let's go on. Uh, I would start with something like, uh, I don't know uh, all the participants here, but observing, so the first time I visited TNC, it was beginning of 2000. And uh, it was very much different event than uh, we can observe nowadays. So, and uh, what I uh, get information is that many people who are calling them NMR people, they never saw any real signals, especially uh, free induction decays. So then the NMR people in, let's say 50 years ago, NMR people had to, do everything had to do uh, development uh, hardware software and everything and uh, chemistry itself and now uh, things are different uh, people are split it and uh, everybody who is using nmr somehow they are calling them nmr people and coming to your circumference so uh, that's why this is the 
uh, let's start in point to, for me to give the better, the simpler explanation to everybody and maybe it can be somehow deep uh, for uh, understanding. <clears throat> so things are became, becoming simpler. So uh, the hardware uh, uh, without actually a real software processing software is now uh, trans transferring to the systems that uh, have artificial artificial intelligence. They can, they can do uh, multivariate analysis, and your all your processing can go into your uh, mobile phone. But nonetheless, we have uh, uh, one lack of that. So people never, many people never saw FID. So uh, the topic of today's discussion uh, of today's presentation is. Uh, somehow not the high resolution spectroscopy, not not imaging, and not definitely uh, the, the try the for to embrace the for uh, the whole range of low field and MR relaxometry. So I would rather concentrate on something that re uh, decays very, really fast, and something that uh, is given uh, that that has the some uh, let's say some advantages to be observed. In the in the time domain NMR, uh, because we are dealing with uh, dipolar Hamiltonian, so let let's go on. Uh, so the two problems that arise when uh, when researchers are coming to low field NMR, uh, let's say inexpensive low field NMR experimentations, uh, they conclude conclude in the following. Uh, the first problem is the homogeneity of the magnetic field of the polarizing magnetic field is not, is uh, actually not so so huge not so perfect comparing to classical nmr that that uh, chemists are studying in, in the universities so this is not high resolution and the homogeneity is much worse so just imagine that if you put the uh, sample of something sample of water the fid will decay within uh, some milliseconds so though it should decay within uh, some seconds so the uh, the first problem is inhomogeneity but since we are talking about really solid and rigid samples, uh, since it's a topic of our discussion today, uh, we are dealing with really fast decays. That, uh, for those reasons, the classical in uh, classical homogeneity of uh, of a time domain MR machine normally is more than enough to observe undistorted relaxation of uh, of the rigid samples. Though to look at the relaxation of uh, of something with a longer relaxation times like liquids or like uh, soft materials, it's enough to use uh, echo techniques for to observe uh, and to measure relaxation times. And another problem uh, is uh, is more serious. This is so-called ringing time or dead time of the probe, because you apply on the pulse and then you, then after the pulse the pl uh, the pulse is the excitation of the NMR is normally some kilovolts on the coil and the reply of the spin system uh, induces i guess some microvolts in the coil and this so this is huge gap uh, and the transition takes some time normally it is around 10 microseconds somehow longer somehow somehow shorter but these 10 microseconds uh, you know looking at, at the picture uh, they are serious. They uh, they have a considerable part of the of the FID signal that is hidden behind the uh, transition the, uh, the process. That's why uh, this is a great problem, and uh, there are some hardware tricks how to overcome that. Uh, for example, to make come back to the cross coils, one coil for receiver, one coil for transmitter. Either uh, there is the way to generate solid echo or Quite popular in recent years, magic sandwich echo sequences, and uh, so uh, we would have from 80 to 95 percent refocusing of this of the rigid part, and so this uh, this problem somehow can be solved. So uh, actually, there are no other really really strong problems uh, when you come from the classical NMR spectroscopy to NMR of uh, NMR electrometry of solid samples. Uh, talking about the signal to noise ratio, of course, the higher field, the higher frequency, the stronger signal you have. But uh, on the other hand, modern techniques and modern microchips and transistors, they allow to uh, retrieve uh, quite faint and, and weak signals. So uh, what is time domain NMR in general? 
So uh, in general, we look at the at some Hamiltonians. For example, for classical chemical shifts, you are dealing with the Zeeman part of Hamiltonian. Or, or, or when you talk about the J coupling, this is another part of Hamiltonians. But when we are uh, coming to the NMR relaxometry, the main influence on the signals are coming from the uh, direct spin spin, or in other words, it's a dipolar Hamiltonian. And everything is dancing around this dipolar Hamiltonian. We will speak about it slightly later, somehow more. And what is normally solid? Solid is uh, uh, rarely something homogeneous. Uh, normally, solid has different phases, or it can have porous systems, and or it can it can have some implementation of, of liquid inside. And uh, so, solid is not normally the uni something uniform. And you always, when you try to look at the FID, since uh, such a FID that many people still didn't see in, in their life. When you look at the FID, you see at least two components for, in the signal, unless you are talking about some, something like something very dry or something or some some artificial polarly fields. Then, uh, you know, from our experience talking to customers, so, so we install an instrument, so we are talking to customers who have quite uh, not bad uh, education in physics or chemistry. And they are somehow familiar with NMR. And when we are coming back to the we are coming to the topic of NMR instruments, NMR time domain NMR, everybody is pronouncing, I want to measure relaxation times, I want to know relaxation times, and everything is dancing around relaxation times. Uh, uh, so the main impression of most of, uh, of classical NMR, uh, not dedicated NMR customers, NMR users. They are talking about relaxation times. Okay, relaxation time is something really interesting, especially when you are implementing quite simplified of, uh, approach of, uh, of Blomberg and personal pound theory. So you have some dependence of your relaxation times onto the uh, frequency and the mobility of, of your uh, molecules. And then you can get some quite valuable information, but not, actually, it's not really only the relaxation times, uh, especially when you are dealing with solids, when you are dealing with the uh, multiple phase phases in solids, so you normally see some different contributions. And even if you are talking about exponential relaxation, you uh, anyhow will uh, in ma many many cases you are going to get uh, the uh, signal that can be decomposed into different components. And these different components they have different contributions, uh, and they have might have different realization times. And this is already more interesting, and this is bringing really more information. So the single relaxation time is 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 just something very much simplified. So the so my message is that time domain NMR is much more uh, interesting and can bring really more information about the structure and dynamics of samples. So and if we take uh, one of the classical signal FID uh, or magic sandwich checker of, of, let's say, take a piece of starch or piece of cellulose and put it into the NMR machine and you, you will see the decay that I already mentioned can be composed out of at least two components. One is decaying fast and this is, it means that the faster decay, the uh, low mobility and uh, so and uh, it, it is normally the case within 20 up to maximally 50 or 60 microseconds if you take something rigid it will decay anyhow within this range and something that decays uh, with a longer uh, longer curve longer relaxation and this is definitely more mobile phase and then in this let's say in time domain NMR you also can go from this time domain signal to, to do a, a kind of spectroscopy to observe symmetric spectra. Uh, and in this spectra, you will see lines that are uh, evenly, let's say, aligned around zero frequency. And then you you have something in might have something in between that is more mobile, a narrow line, and might, you might have the wider line that represents the rigid phase. And uh, we will talk about uh, this wide line in more details just in several slides and uh, here looking at you can also can do some inverse laplace transformation and get uh, the distribution of relaxation uh, times but now i want to stress out in my very short talk that uh, when you will deal uh, with, with the different regions of solids so everything that decays within 550 microseconds 
this is definitely something rigid and uh, everything that decays from let's say 50 60 microseconds to a few milliseconds this is normally soft unless you are talking about some like that some water with a uh, huge drop, dropping of gadolinium or, or something more paramagnetic but for any normal samples there is from 50 microseconds to some milliseconds it is something soft and then if you are above above some four five six milliseconds this is not definitely liquid this is very important thing that for you to to keep in mind when you we will deal with time domain in my machine uh then talking about the I already discussed some hamiltonian things i will not uh, talk a lot now so all the spin systems they can be somehow described by the the evolution can be described by the density operator and the hamiltonian the dipolar hamiltonian that we have in time domain nmr it assumes it can be let's say decomposed into so called uh, e, uh, so called dipolar al al alphabet uh, and then where you can see something that gives the real uh, the observable signal signal and something really interesting like let's say uh, zero quantum transitions or, or even if we talk about two spins double quantum transitions and this is a fantastic topic unfortunately we don't have time for that now but but this is very much interesting so uh and then of course when we coming back we are coming to the real systems we are dealing with the uh, with some spectra of molecular motions we look at uh, at uh, correlation functions and getting to know the correlation function it is very important to when you're investigating solids rigids and when you are looking at polymers and so for polymer people to get to know the how the correlation function of a, of, a, of a molecule uh, looks like it's very important task uh, so this slide is sum summarizing some just very basic equations and uh, we are coming to very known uh equations that uh, describe the behavior of relaxation times versus the mobility uh, and, uh, and the <clears throat> actually the field and uh, the contribution to hamiltonian can be uh can be subdivided into or the structural con uh, contribution and dynamical contribution so structure is within this letter m2 and dynamics is within this energy spectra and uh, so this is the, the classical uh, how the, uh, the behavior relaxation times looks with the with the uh, dependence of the correlation time and we will talk today really more about this second moment because this is very important uh, thing so here i showed you once again just to be sure that this is structure and this is dynamics and uh, in that but in that bpp model that is actually uh, declared in most of the textbooks about uh, the tandem and nmr there is the one there is one thing this is uh, the limit of slow motions so uh, you know that the so the dipolar interactions they are strong and but uh, and they are uh, they are provided by the dipolar hamiltonians but when we have the molecular motions, molecules are moving, spins are moving, and then the magnetic fields from neighbors are averaging uh, on a on a definite spin that we are observing, and so the faster motion, the, the narrower line in the spectrum, the longer relaxation time. Uh, I mean, to two. But uh, we have the limit when these motions are too much slow, and they become become even uh, longer than t two. So nothing is averaging nothing and uh, this is the limit this is the definite limit of implementation of classical bpp approach to calculate relaxation times when your tau or the correlation time is equal to relaxation time this is already nonsense and nothing is happening late uh, with the increase of the correlation time and uh, when we are talking about dipolar couple, uh, coupled uh, systems if we consider even two spins then they are given something like a big doublet <clears throat> so and this doublet <clears throat> is a wide line and we, if you have many spins sometimes this doublet is flattened on top and you have something rectangular with the just let's say Gau gaussian decaying wings uh, uh, this is very much characteristic especially for <clears throat> really crystalline uh, materials uh, so and i just show some results of the simulations 
if you just I just have taken mud cut and uh, written some 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 simple equations and try to simulate the uh, the vibrations of uh, around one axis of the two, of two spins and this is how the spectra uh, look like depending on the temperature and uh, so this the the polar constant or let's say second moment that is also also represent the polar constant it is constant but then it starts going down it is just very simple uh, calculation and this actually comes from this condition when you are approaching uh, with your t2 you're approaching the correlation time uh, then these are some uh, i have tried to review really many publications about the behavior of the second moment or the polar constant and this confirms the idea that nothing is changing until some temperature when uh, the the motions of the molecular motions of the of, uh, of a sample of a, of a molecules they come to the spectrum of the uh, the native spectrum of, of an MR that is not dependent on the motion so so when uh, the uh, the magnitude of of uh, let's say magnetic field fluctuations approaches the uh, the, the frequency approaches the uh, second moment with then you have this um, observable second moments to go down uh, and here are some other uh, other results from uh, really different different samples and the, the reason why we have observed the wider line in crystalline uh, samples the, rather than in, in amorphous that <clears throat> that in crystalline samples everything is packed quite in or in the other way in amorphous everything is not really packed and the distance between nuclei is the average distance is closer and the second that the in, in crystal the correlation of uh, the let's say the molecules the spins are moving uh, the neighbor 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 spins are moving cooperatively also all together so they uh, let's say uh, mutual uh, mutual uh, displacement is not really significant that's why we don't observe the average of the of the line and uh, normally in in real crystals you have the splitting of the spectral line that that uh, br brings you the oscillation in the fid but as far as i already mentioned uh, so many samples they contain different phases and the, uh, and uh, they are not as simple as just two uh, spin system normally your signal uh, will uh, will have either contributions so something from if you have something rigid then you might have something like like the doublet or just flattened uh, and the widened uh, gaussian uh, shape and uh, so the fid look look like this and normally actually saying bpp model works perfectly for liquids not so good for soft materials and that it doesn't work for rigid materials and uh, I try to uh, estimate what people are normally looking at uh, when they uh, look at the crystallinity or uh, the free induction decay of solid samples. And people normally look at crystallinity and everything that comes from crystallinity. And here I just enumerate some uh, some direction that can be used and that are used in in, in routine application that are used in uh, let's say in scientific application. Uh, so so I don't want to uh, read them because you all can see what's happening. Actually, Mark, I have a question. How many minutes do I have more? I don't know, maybe maybe uh, five. Ten. About five to 10 minutes. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, then, uh, so uh, some of these uh, applications are already more or less standard, for example, for poly, poly uh, actually polypropylene solubility uh, or poly, polyethylene density or many, many others. So, but we are looking at the crystallinity and the crystallinity is something that uh, gives you, uh, so the, let's say amorphous part behaves more or less in the Gaussian way, crystalline part normally behaves in something more complicated way, more, more complex way. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, uh, since we are also talking about the, uh, the industrial application, one of the most used applications of, of time domain NMR is uh, determination of some solid content. So classical is the standard of, there is ESO standard, there is ASTM standard, and this is everything about, uh, let's say, the, something that decays fast and decays slow. And a very robust approach is not to do any fitting because normally uh, it's not that easy to 
pick up the right model for fitting function of the decay. Uh, so this, these guys develop in the standard just to measure some average point here and average point here. And, uh, and let's think that this point L, this represents something that is liquid and this point S that represents something that is rich or, or, or solid. Uh, and then uh, you can do some very simple uh, calculation to get the content of solid. So, and this works not only for parts, this also works for really many uh, directions, uh, like I already uh, uh, show, uh, already show here, uh, solubility of polypropylene and density of polyethylene, and said actually Mel flow index and many, many more. Uh, but uh, next, uh, just, just let's say in the more or less finalizing part, we are coming to the question what to do if relaxation curve is not really uh, well resolved like here. So here we have, we see the resolution. We have something long and something short, but sometimes in many, many cases, you you have amorphous part that is actually quite solid and we, you have a crystalline part that is also very much solid and that everything is hidden between one, within one line, within one uh, relaxation curve. <clears throat> so there are, there are existing some classical approach and some people like to do the fitting with the so-called peak function or Abragamian function. Uh, but uh, and you can see, so they, they work somehow, but you know, uh, this works absolutely not for all the possible samples. And in the many, many cases here, people are trying to, researchers are trying to pick up other new functions to implement how to fit the signals. but. Uh, here I am presenting you the approach of the so-called measure of second moment. This is really interesting thing. So uh, first, I try to measure second moment. Uh, there are many different ways to measure second moment. You can get the spectrum and calculate the integrate with this spectrum. You can do the fitting, or you can do, uh, let's say, a variation of signals and try to calibrate. So uh, what we uh, mentioned, what we, let's say, somehow discovered, but I don't think this is this was the first uh, discovery, but we somehow published that for in the in one of food journals, that the crystallinity has really great, really great uh, linear dependence with the second moment. Crystallinity of sugars, and then I tried to investigate myself, and I, and I found that there are, there are correlations with the with uh, natural, with artificial polymers, and they more or less like to be within one line. And it is really awesome. And if we look at the classical functions that are described in this oscillation in FID, you can uh, notice that they all, when you do the Taylor expansion of them, uh, Taylor series expansion of them, you can see that they all have only even contribution in the expansion. So, and you know that the, 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 the contribution of the second part with the second moment and the fourth moment. But in terms of the second moment, they all, let's say the beginning of all these curves, the beginning of all these curves can be somehow described by a parabolic function, by just the, uh, by the squared, uh, squared parabolic function. And so if you take the classical Gaussian uh, exponential decay, uh, you will have also <clears throat> the uh, the even even uh, even uh, uh, even uh, terms in the expansions in the Taylor Taylor expansion, and so you can somehow express your T two via the second moment. You can express T two in the in the Gaussian function, but you do, normally don't have real T two in such complex things because T two is the time when something is decaying in E times. Uh, but here we don't have the decay in e times because we have we are multiplying by the uh, by the decaying function. So uh, and uh, so we have developed quite nice approach. We now uh, apply it uh, already uh, in order the the contribution from publication. That's why I'm talking about this quite uh, quite easy. Uh, so fitting of the different relaxation curves. So let me see. This is the the black one is the experiment and the first initial ten let's the initial ten microseconds are uh, are fitted by by Abragamian P Gaussian and even polynomial function and they more or less behave equally in the beginning. It means that this approach of the so-called second moment approximation, so what we are doing, uh, is very much interesting. Uh, so we 
can fit with the Gaussian, the beginning of, the, of any relaxation curve. And then this, uh, let's say, this will work. This will give you a correlation, for example, with the crystallinity of sugars uh, of, of, of anything. So just to take the second moment uh, and then can, you can then convert this second moment into the relaxation time uh, using uh, such an expression. Uh, and uh, you'd, for calculating the second moment, you don't need to do any fitting of the functions with many, many parameters. You can do just the integration of your spectrum. So that is quite straightforward. And you can get something like the observable T2. Let's call it again like T2 star because it's observable. It's not real T2, but it's observable, but you can use this thing. And we decided that we can call it like a, 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 like a second moment approximation. So just uh, some, some uh, results uh, uh, of, of my, let's say, somehow random talk. So for the measurement of rigids of solids, uh, the requirement for magnets are not so strict. That's why the magnets can be made even cheaper than they are. So uh, the great problem that is the ringing of that time of, of the probe somehow can be resolved with solid and sandwich checker. So you can see, let's say, for example, crystalline uh, correlation of the crystallinity made by X-ray and the by NMR, it's quite, quite linear. So it means that, that these guys are working. So what's important practically, the rigid part of any sample decays within initial 50 microseconds. Uh, this is very much important. Then another thing, classical theory about relaxation times does not work for rigid. Uh, rigid. This is absolutely ma a must to know. But you know, the, the, what's funny that sometimes you read some publication and you see trying to using use this DPP for solid sample. And using ratios is like an SFC uh, average is good. And uh, what we are offering, the co we are offering so-called so second moment approximation, use the second moment to characterize T2 of any sample without, let's say, without fitting. And actually, I guess that's all. Unfortunately, the, we need to talk really more and talk about uh, T1. Uh, we need to talk about spin diffusion or multiple quantum transition and data, pro data processing. But of course, uh, I guess I'm not able to do it within my half an hour. And uh, sorry for some delays. And thank you, Ivan and Amar, very much. Thank you, uh, Leonid, for a very insightful presentation. And uh, if uh, anyone wants to uh, ask questions, we can have a couple of questions, and then we might also have a more extended discussion after all three presentations. So okay. do we have I, any questions? I have a question. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Grunin, for this talk. And uh, I have a question, because right now I'm working on some sample that it's uh, the solvent is the deuterium oxide. Mm -hmm. And I'm having problem with getting a good signal and a good quality of the FID using the Han echo. Do you think it's a suitable sequence for measuring this sample and getting the T2 or should I use the CPMG? It depends on the T2 that, that you want to have. If you are talking about quite short T2, you might uh, you need to use the Han echo. But for longer decays, CPMG. So, what are your samples? It's a protein, twenty percent solution in deuterium oxide. In deuterium oxide, I guess. I guess you you might start with the. Uh, so you know, uh, it can be influence of the inhomogeneity and diffusion. Uh, I would measure both Haneko and and CPMG, and and uh, both of them are valuable. Okay, thank you. Okay, let us move on for the next talk, and we will have a little bit more time for the more extended discussions and questions. And so the next talk uh, will be coming from the from the lab of Professor Majid Halil Ostop from the Middle East Technical University of Ankara, and. Uh, uh, I would uh, uh, have a pleasure to present a student from the lab of Professor Majid, Gyozde uh, Ozeshme Thailand, and she's PhD student in biotechnology of uh, 
at the university and uh, her basic interests are low field NMR for biotechnology drug. This is her project and main focus in the biotechnological drug delivery uh, by polysaccharides and use of the time domain and NMR to study those processes. So with that, I give you a podium and uh, Gözde, go ahead, please start. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to present our work uh, in this panel. My name is Gözde. Uh, I am doing PhD in biotechnology under supervision of uh, Professor Medix. Uh, today, I am presenting on behalf of him. Uh, our pre my presentation focuses on investigation of health problems in biotechnological drugs by TDNMR and MRI. And I will show some preliminary results of our project. Uh, biotechnological drugs uh, that uh, are bi biological drugs that have a, a peptide or protein structure and uh, are produced in uh, living organisms using uh, recombinant DNA technology. Uh, monoclonal antibodies, enzymes, hormones, vaccines, peptides uh, used for the gene therapy are uh, the major type of uh, biotechnological drugs. Uh, they are uh, in the protein and peptide structure. They are easily affected by the changes in environmental conditions, such as uh, agitation, temperature, humidity, and pH. Um, making sure that the drugs produced in the targeted quality has vital importance for the patient. In the quality control processes, pharmaceutical starting materials, uh, active substances, uh, finished products are subject to the uh, test. Uh, these are uh, conventional tests, which I will uh, tell you, HPSC, LCMS, XRD, FDIR, and high resolution NMR spectroscopy. And uh, it is an important advantage to control the quality of the drugs quickly and without prior preparation. Here, a low field NMR, such as a time domain NMR, TD NMR and MRI I, uh, are widely used in the polymer, food and pharmaceutical industry because uh, of their low cost, short time for the analysis, easy to use and non-invasive analysis. Uh, pharmaceutical quality control, control refers to the processes and procedures implemented to ensure that pharmaceutical products meet the required quality, safety, and efficacy standards. Uh, they include uh, evaluating the physical and chemical properties of the drugs or the drug substances. And non-invasive quality control methods refers to the techniques that uh, allow for the assessment of the quality of a product without causing damage or alteration to it. TDNMR and NMR, uh, uh, MRI can be used as non-invasive low-cost pharmaceutical quality control methods. And currently, we can use TDNMR to evaluate the physical chemical properties of pharmaceuticals, such as hydration states of the API, examine the structure of the solid state drugs, in identification and differential, uh, differential analysis of original or counterfeit drugs, crystalline state of the API, in solid dosage form, uh, the state of water incorporated in wet granules, and the dispersion state of pharmaceutical nano suspensions. Uh, in this section, I will summarize some examples uh, from the literature on the use of TDNMR techniques in pharmaceutical application. Uh, in this study, they use TDNMR uh, analysis to quantify water content in pharmaceutical ingredients, uh, is demonstrated. Uh, a range of integrants, powder, powders uh, with identified amount of wo uh, added water were tested. They uh, obtained the C2 relaxation curves and the um, powder blend consisting of a model API and tablet excipients uh, also examined to evaluate. Um, they conclude that the accuracy of the water content determination was equivalent to the conventional method which is currently shared uh, in this study. And um, they show that TDNMR method could, could become an attractive method for monetary water content in manufacturing pharmaceuticals, especially for wet granulation processes. 
Uh, because of the time limitation, I am not going into details of the uh, parameters of the NMR, but you can see in the slides. In another study, um, they used the NMR for uh, characterize, characterizing of the active pharmaceutical in uh, you can see at the table. Uh, they um, study for identification, the salt and free base of APIs by uh, TDNMR. Different uh, crystalline forms can be distinguished by T1 relaxation curves, we know that, and they aim at uh, T2 relaxation measurements for the investigation of different crystalline forms. Uh, study first characterized the crystalline form of salt and free base of the APIs by conventional methods, uh, XRD and DSD. Then T1 and T2 relaxation uh, curve curves were uh, obtained. Conclude that T1 and T2 relaxation has sufficient capacity to distinguish between free base and salt of the tested APIs, um, which differ in their uh, crystalline forms. In another study, they used TDNMR for quantitative uh, evaluation of the crystals of the indometacin, which is a model API. They uh, blend amorphous and crystalline indomatism powders at the designated ratios, and they obtain T2 relaxation curves. Uh, they demonstrate the good correlation between theoretical and experimental uh, percentage of the crystallinity. Uh, they test indomatism powders with uh, unknown proportion of crystallinity, and they compare with uh, their estimated crystallinity with them. Uh, that found using Raman spectroscopy. The quantitative performance of TDNMR technique was comparable with the conventional technique. And uh, also they uh, state that TDNMR was still able to quantify the crystalline of indomitus, even the uh, one excipients were incorporated into the sample. So uh, they conclude that the study had for evaluating the crystalline of APA, APIs by TDNMR in pharmaceutical science. Uh, in another study, they use TDNMR for characterization solutions of antibodies that simulate a biologic pharmaceutical formulation. Uh, these are the parameters, and TDNMR uh, is shown to be very sensitive to difference in the amount of antibody in solution, uh, with the ability to detect variation is as low as two milligram per milliliter. However, uh, the results illustrate the difference, but not enlighten their origin. Um, they extracted uh, relaxation times reflect the combined effect of all solutes because uh, in the solvent, which is water most of the time for the biotechnological drugs. Uh, in another study, they use TDNMR to characterize the crystalline state of APIs containing uh, solid dosage forms. Uh, they got the T1 relaxation times. And uh, up to date, we know that TDNMR has been used to investigate uh, for physical properties of APIs. With T1 and T2 relaxation behavior measurements, uh, they succeeded in characterizing their hydration state molecular mobility. In both uh, selected APIs, the T1 values of the crystalline form were greater than those of the amorphous form. Uh, but they said that it is difficult to distinguish crystalline uh, and amorphous APIs by T2 relaxation behavior. So uh, to move on, uh, our project, uh, uh, low fit and MR for uh, biotechnological pharmaceuticals, our project name. We focus on aggregation, quantitative formulation errors, crystallization, glycation, and uh, determination of crystallinity of uh, lyophilized drugs. Uh, we uh, investigate the quality problems with select uh, biotechnology drugs. The first part of is detection of aggregation in biotechnology drugs by TDNMR and MRI. Uh, as you all know, aggregation is one of the most widely recognized quality problems of protein-based uh, therapeutics in the formulation, transportation, and storage phases. And aggregation affects long-term stability under different handling, transportation, and storage conditions. 
A conventional techniques are very expensive and they need invasive sample preparation and they have long test duration. In our work, we use the TDN NMR to detect aggregation of simulin R, which is our model drug, under different uh, stresses. Uh, first one is thermal stress at 50 degrees Celsius, and second is a uh, controlled agitation at 250 RPM uh, at 50 degrees Celsius. These are our uh, preliminary results. Um, uh, we analyze the R2 values, which is uh, defined as the 1 over T2 relaxation rate, and uh, see the response to the presence of aggregates generated through different stress. Uh, as you can see from uh, the results, uh, these zero uh, Rs are the control groups, and it, for each uh, stress, R2 is increased after. Um, 36 hours and 120 hours. It is more in agitation uh, uh, stress more than heating. Uh, we, we may conclude that R2 uh, may have to detect the presence of protein aggregates, which is uh, directly related with the quality of the drugs. Also, this is important. The NMR can detect both small and large aggregates and invisible particles, even though protein concentration is low which is the case in our uh, experiments because in humilin R, the insulin concentration is 3.4 uh, for uh, 8 milligram per milliliter. Um, this is the MRI result of uh, our experiments. Uh, this is the control. This is heating and agitation samples. Uh, as you can see, there is no difference between uh, control and heating sample. Uh, we, we cannot detect any uh, color change or any aggregation uh, by naked eye. However, with the um, uh, MRI image intensities, we can see the differences. So uh, MRI can be a quick tool to detect quality problems. In the uh, agitation and the control uh, samples, we can change the color change by uh, eye. And the MRI um, image uh, intensity differences also show the uh, the extreme case. Uh, the, okay, the second part is detecting uh, detecting insulin uh, quantitative uh, mixture ratios. Uh, here, uh, our aim is to detect different uh, mixing ratios for regular insulin, insulin R, and the uh, insulin NPH. Uh, humulin N. They are fast and slow acting analogs of uh, insulin drugs on the market. Uh, different uh, mixture ratios uh, are based on the needs and lifestyle of the patients are available in the hospitals. So the NMR shows correlation map between T1 and T2, which shows uh, different proton pools. And proton pools refer to distinct groups of the proton within a sample that exhibits similar uh, relaxation properties. It's high concentration of um, humidin R to humidin N. We notice a major uh, here proton uh, pool. As the con concentration of the regular uh, insulin decreases uh, here, uh, and M uh, insulin N increases, other proton pool becomes predominant, here you can see. Uh, by measuring these proton pools, we can differentiate between uh, different mixture ratios of insulin drugs. Uh, here, you can see the animation. Uh, sorry. I think you. Sorry. Yeah. Yes, it's started. Uh, within each increase in the humilin N, the intensity of the proton pool in this area increases. This area indicates the uh, water-solid interaction of the um, undissolved part of humilin N. So as it is a uh, suspension, so uh, in the circle you can see that the area in the yeah, proton pools uh, is increasing by increasing humilin N uh, concentration in solution. Yeah. Okay, 
official ones again. Okay. And this is the end of my presentation. Uh, thank you for listening to me. And if you have any question, I am glad to answer. Thank you very much, Gözde. Yeah, um, we have uh, the time for for a couple of quick questions if the audience has. Okay, if there's no questions, we can uh, move Actually, on. Actually, I would I would ask very short question if it's okay. possible. What about the yeah. shape of relaxation uh, in in these pills? You are talking about really fast relaxation or eight or nine microseconds. So how does it look like, and how it was estimated? Uh, in which experiments, basically? Yes, in, 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 in your NMR, you, to get this relaxation, you are measuring which, which sequence have you, did you use for such a shot? And how... Sorry? Can you, can you ask again, please? I, I couldn't get your voice. Sorry. I, I mean, how did, how did the signal look like uh, when you talk about eight or nine microseconds relaxation time? Uh, actually, I don't have that information, but I will look at and uh, tell you after the uh, panel if you want. Okay, thank you. Sure. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, let's move on. And it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, my old colleague, Professor Igor Mastihin. Um, he got his PhD in chemical physics, and his thesis was on the shockwave effects in the biological system, as far as I recall, and studied by uh, magnetic resonance applications. But uh, after a couple of postdocs, he became a faculty member in MRI Center of Department of Physics at the University of New Brunswick in Fredericton, Canada. Uh, where he is working ever since, and his interests include materials research using MRI, and his most recent and exciting area is the design and the use of portable NMI instruments for elastometry and rheology, which uh, I, I frankly also very much interested in. So uh, please, uh, Igor, the podium is yours. Well, thank you, Mike, Mark, very much. And uh, uh, it's an honor for me to present here. Uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. And uh, I'll talk about, well, it is time domain NMR, but a bit of a different kind, I would say. Um, and um, uh, we let's see. Yeah, so we are actually here in, uh, uh, well, in the University of uh, New Brunswick in uh, Fredericton. New Brunswick, so this uh, red, uh, or rather green shape over here. And uh, UNB MRI Center is a center dedicated to studies of materials and how to uh, work with them using MRI methods and devices. So I'd like to acknowledge students who contributed to the work, mostly uh, Will Selby, who has been most instrumental. And uh, also uh, other faculty members, uh, in addition to myself, Bruce Balcom, our director, uh, Ben Newling, and uh, he, their student, uh, Sebastian Richard, uh, for the work uh, on uh, pipe flows. And they use the same principle I'm going to talk about. So the basic idea of the talk is um, uh, as follows. So uh, what are dynamic properties? Well, it is a sample response to dynamic stress. So you shake a sample uh, and particles begin to move. You, uh, you have velocity in the sample and then you detect that velocity. Uh, portable NMR uh, is uh, essentially a localized measurement with a portable device. So your signal comes from a spot located in your sample. And uh, when you have velocity present in that spot, well, uh, you will have uh, phase proportional to the velocity. Uh, if you have a distribution of velocity, you have NMR phase interference, and that will result in a signal decay, which will uh, let you extract information about the dynamic property of interest. 
So the basic idea is quite simple and go over that uh, along the way. And I'll talk about two different, well, but related ways or we can talk about dynamic properties. One of them is, uh, well, you have viscoelasticity as a property. The, the sample is elastic and you squeeze it and it uh, gets compressed, or you stretch it, becomes stretched. And it means particles will move in response to oscillatory stress. And uh, uh, what's important because uh, pretty much uh, any part of our body is viscoelastic. And when something happens to it, that it changes elasticity, uh, which is uh, a measure of some abnormality. And it's also very important in material science. So we'd like to measure it non-invasively. And how do we measure non-invasively? Well, typically we use elastometry, uh, ultrasound or MRI. And another thing uh, related to introduction of stress is uh, rheology or other field um, where you apply a shear stress to a fluid and it responds. And uh, if fluid uh, has uh, Newtonian properties, uh, its viscosity will be uh, the same regardless of the stress. But if it is non-Newtonian fluid, it will become uh, less viscous or more viscous depending on the type of the fluid. And again, typical way of measuring it by uh, usually applying a shear stress with a rheometer or with the NMR rheometer. So um, to measure the response, we need to encode uh, sample velocity. And in NMR, we typically do that by manipulating uh, the applied magnetic field gradient or uh, application time. And by this, we can then encode the phase with information on uh, well displacement. And uh, then we can extract that information, right? Uh, when it comes to elastometry, we uh, have a very well developed field called MR elastography. So you operate your sample to induce waves. Those waves propagate, and the wave velocity depends on the elasticity of the material. And uh, you have the NMR phase change. You measure the velocity map. You convert it into elasticity map. That's pretty much how it is done. Uh, when it comes to geometry. Um, NMR rheometry is actually quite an amazing field where you most frequently essentially you just build a uh, some sort of a quiet cell typically inside your NMR spectrometer. And so uh, you place your fluid of interest between two rotating cylinders, you introduce shear stress, and you measure velocity uh, within the gap between those cylinders. So we're talking about the gap of maybe one to three millimeters, and you measure velocity, well, spatial result, obviously. Uh, and uh, it can give you lots of interesting information on your sample property and behavior. But one issue, of course, is that uh, the typical NMR, analytical NMR or MRI instrument is quite big and expensive, and it's laboratory equipment, so you cannot really work with it in the field. And that is a bit of a challenge. So, but if you think about it, we don't really need to have a very homogeneous field. And usually when talking about MRI uh, scanners or uh, analytical MRI instruments, well, we require a highly homogeneous field because it's like result fine in details of a signal. But if you just want to excite an MRI signal, you don't need to have a homogeneous field. All you need is intersection, intersection of your B1 and B0 and uh, where they intersect, you will get the signal and we'll call that place a sensitive spot or sensitive, sensitive volume, excuse me. And uh, some of you might remember an ad from Magritech for about 15 years ago now, uh, where we had a, a person holding the portable NMR in the hand. And uh, the appeal of portable NMR is that it's very inexpensive. It's obviously mobile. You can apply to a sample of any size, um, and uh, it well, opens so many exciting new applications. But it has some limitations, of course. But let's focus on exciting parts first. So portable NMR uh, magnetic resonance. Uh, well, um, our lab builds our instruments ourselves. And uh, I think we're pretty good at building them with the desired properties, specifically what kind of stray field above you have so that you have well-controlled uh, constant gradient 
in the census plot. Um, uh, magnet arrays are built uh, from permanent magnets. Again, they're cheap and simple. You typically use RF surface coil. It can be synodal coil when it comes down to study flows. Uh, census spot is uh, at several centimeters, but typically one to two centimeters away from the surface. The gradient is quite strong. It is also quite permanent, so you cannot really change it. And means we use Spinnaker to refocus our homogeneity and uh, get the signal. And uh, there was a just conversation earlier about Matt Augustine. He has actually one of our magnet arrays to study tomatoes uh, non-invasively, if I remember correctly. So how do we measure these properties with portable NMR? Uh, the basic idea is simple. So it's a constant gradient, so we cannot change the gradient strength, uh, but we can uh, change the evolution time between our uh, RF pulses, uh, or we can change the timing of our instrument relative to vibration phase, for example. And the spins will move uh, through the gradient, the accumulate phases, and the signal will be acquired with an RF coil. And when all your spins move in sync, uh, we have, a, so for example, you have a longitudinal wave through your sample. Um, you can then measure elastic properties uh, right away. The way it works like this. So you build the following setup. You just squeeze your sample and use longitudinal waves. Um, measure velocity or measure velocity waveforms. It look kind of like this. Um, and uh, the velocity will depend on elasticity. You convert them to, uh, into stress plots. And uh, that works for actually for complex waveforms as well. So you measure response uh, in your sample to the applied stress, applied oscillatory stress, and depending on elasticity of the material, you will have uh, different responses. You can convert them into your elastic modulus. Now things become actually more interesting uh, when you have distribution of velocities in your sensitive spot or sensitive volume. Because in that case, your signal will be composed of uh, many signals coming from different parcels, and uh, those parcels will move different velocities, hence different phases. And that means your signal actually will be decaying. Even though you might have coherent motion, your signal will be decaying. Um, uh, and uh, well, example is if you have spins rotating in a magnetic field gradient, like when you have a circle and spins are moving in a circle in the gradient, or oscillating in the gradient, and then the signal actually will be decay as a Bessel function. So it's quite neat. So you have the distribution of velocities that will cause a signal decay, and you can manipulate the decay. You can actually extract that information. In uh, conventional MRI, you see it uh, sometimes as well, something very similar, but when people talk about intravoxel dephasing. So here we have just one giant voxel. So it's our sensitive volume is a single voxel, essentially, what we study in there uh, uh, is important. So we can apply to studies of laminar flow as well. So imagine this is a pipe and you have a flow in the pipe and typically you have a Poiseuille flow when you have a Newtonian fluid. So it has this parabolic shape uh, shown here as a red line. Um, so when you, your sensitive spot uh, uh, is large enough to cover the whole uh, cross section of the pipe, um, essentially, the sensor spot is uh, your integrator, right? So all those different uh, parcels with different velocities added together, and you will get some signal dependence on velocity profile. And uh, for non-Newtonian fluids, you can have a shear thinning or shear thickening fluid. You have different profiles correspondingly, and that means that it will result in a different uh, signal behavior. That uh, these three plots at the bottom show how your magnetization changes with the echo time uh, for three types of fluids. So uh, Newtonian fluid, uh, shear thickening fluid, and shear thinning fluid. Uh, well, the same approach can be applied to, for example, turbulent flow. Again, you have a flow that is turbulent, uh, and the turbulent flows are characterized by plug-like profiles. That means you have, again, sorry, a different distribution of those velocities inside, inside the pipe. And uh, again, you can observe transition from laminar flow to turbulent flow by using this approach. Uh, and uh, you can actually extract information on 
what uh, what exactly is the velocity profile in your pipe. Now another example is uh, well um, we can take a quet flow, which is the flow of fluid between two rotating cylinders. Um, it's well characterized analytically. We know exactly what velocity we will get uh, when we have a uh, non-Newtonian fluid, for example. It will velocity distribution will depend on uh, flow index n, and uh, there is quite a lot of work on quiet uh, cells uh, with NMR geometry. And again, as I mentioned before, the way it works, well, you have you have to build that whole thing inside your NMR spectrometer. It's a very laborious affair, and uh, I admire people who actually do that. But if you think about it, uh, so we have, imagine you have this quiet cell, we're looking from, uh, at it from above. What if you just integrate over the whole volume, like shown here? You have distribution to the right, you have distribution to the left. So the total phase, when you add all these signals together, will be zero. And, but the signal mag magnitude will decay in a well-defined way. That's exactly what we did. So we built these apparatus. Like you see, this, this is our quiet cell inside. Uh, the magnet array over there, that's the whole setup. And uh, uh, then uh, we observe how the signal decays. And uh, we can extract uh, the flow index out of those decay curve. And they work actually quite well. And uh, what they're working on now, actually, is, um, well, we talked about compressive stresses and what we can do with them. We talked about shear stresses in fluids. What about shear stress in elastomers, which is important because uh, conventional MR elastography works with the shear waves. They are more sensitive to changes in the tissues because they have greater dispersion, so a greater response in wave speed to changes in the tissues. So um, that is what they're working on, and uh, we put some theory together already. We are running experiments right now, but the principle is exactly the same. So uh, the same simple principle of phase interference in action. So when you have all your spins moving in sync, like uh, in this uh, top uh, picture to the right, again, your phase will be more or less the same. Uh, but when you have a distribution of displacements, that means uh, your shear wave wavelength should be comparable to the sensitive spot size. I then have distribution of phases, and then again, will result in a uh, different response. So we have high hopes, actually. And that is pretty much all. So uh, the way we introduce dynamic information into a signal for portable NMR is uh, we have a well-defined gradient that encodes the displacements. Uh, the phase interference in that volume will change NMR signal. And we can extract information distributions and convert them to dynamic properties. Um, so to conclude, so portable NMR can measure geometric information, um, not too badly. Uh, so we see potential applications uh, in laminar, rotating flows, and viscoelastic materials. And uh, we think that is that is something that can complement. Uh, generally use complex and big expensive fMRI instruments by something simple, uh, specialized, and portable. And I think I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Igor, for this uh, very insightful presentation and very interesting and very unusual application of the benchtop NMRI instruments. And uh, we have a time for questions and then we can go for the discussion uh after that so do we have questions so i have some technical questions uh, Igor, you know we we have worked with berham blumi for a long time on designing different nmr mouses not mice but mouses and uh, and uh, the numbers you are mentioning two three centimeters of depth of penetration so what size of a mouse do you talk about well, uh, our design is slightly different from a mouse. Uh, it involves three magnets. Uh, it's about that big. Uh, it's about 10 by 10 uh, centimeters. Okay, and what gap between magnets do you have? 
So when gaps the are is... small. So we have so three... the, the coil should be quite big, I guess, to to penetrate. Now the whole thing is about uh, the whole thing is pretty much a cube, uh, ten by ten by ten. Uh, okay. Three magnets arranged in a certain way. Uh, the mm -hmm. middle magnet is slightly below. Okay. Uh, I can send you a paper. Uh, that would be great. Yeah, we okay. published. Yeah, it was. Yeah, and uh, uh, the second question. So you actuate mechanical motions uh, synchron synchronously with the pulse sequence. Yep. In mm -hmm. in case of elastomeria, that's what we do. Yeah. Yeah. We have a sensor that uh, triggers uh, our NMR acquisition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Thanks. I have a quick question regarding this. Uh, is it possible in your design, for example, to monitor the formation of the material? It's not like the study of material properties, because some of the hydrogels, specifically in biological system, usually have a long time of the uh, maturation, so to say. So when you start to, gel to form a gel, it might take you several hours or sometimes even days to mm -hmm. the material to fully mature. Is it possible to, to do this kind of the time uh, kinetic measurements uh, in your instrument? Uh, yeah, because uh, what we do, we have, um, so the way the sequence pulse, we use pulse sequences, uh, we have essentially a couple of uh, pulses in the beginning. Uh, we vary the time interval between them to encode dynamic information. And after that, we have a, uh, a CPMG train with really, really short echo time. Uh, and usually we use it just to uh, add all the echoes together to improve signal to noise. But in principle, it can also be used just as a regular uh, CPMG uh, to get uh, T2 information, for example, or other thing. OK, thank you. So now the, we have a time for discussion. If anyone has uh, uh, some comments or questions or something that uh, would like to discuss, we can open the podium for these discussions right now. Actually, I have a question. Uh, if, if I could ask it. Uh, yeah, yeah, in, this, yeah in the second talk, there, um, the, there was some discussion of determining aggregation um, well before it shows up as cloudiness in the insulin solutions. Um, can that is that used in uh, a manufacturing process? Uh, yeah, it can be used. Why not? It is used in, uh, so you can basically run bottles through a uh, a detector and get those results? Yes, it, yes. Oh, okay. No, we, we can discuss whatever you wish. It's up to, yeah, okay. it's up to the audience here, yeah. yeah. Right. You can unmute yourself and uh, ask the question. Even if you want to show something uh, for discussion, you are free to share your screen. Mm -hmm. I guess one hour is, is a very short duration <laughs> to make the introduction to an American luxometry. Yeah. Um, You are you are most welcome to add more if you want at this point. <laughs> yeah, but the, the, yeah. The, the, this this is about make, maybe make, to make a kind of course about that to bring people to local yeah. things. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I don't see any questions for now. Okay, so, so yeah. if there are no more questions, maybe this would be the time to conclude. Yeah, yeah, probably. Okay. Great. So I want to thank everyone who's here. I really enjoyed this talk. In my first efforts of NMR uh, after graduate school, I was involved with the material science department and never actually did rheometry, but the um, but it's always been at the edge of my interest. So anyway, so uh, if there are no more questions, then I will conclude our meeting and thank you everyone for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, okay. Mark and the team.
for Thank your you. discussion. Thank you all. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Lenit, I'll send you the paper. Yeah, great. It would be great. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.